Seven signs of undiagnosed autism in adults. Undiagnosed autism in adults is a lot more common than most people think. If you look at diagnosis rates of children these days, you'll see that statistically there's one or more autistic children in every classroom. And no, it's not an epidemic. We've been here all along. You just need to know what to look for. So in this video, we'll go through some of the things you can look out for to spot autism in adults who, if they were children today, would be getting picked up and diagnosed by the system. Hi everyone, Paul Mikalev here from Autism From The Inside. I make weekly videos sharing the human side of autism, so make sure you hit subscribe to get the latest content. One of the things that often prevents us from noticing autism in adults is an over-reliance on our own stereotypes. So we know that autism comes in all shapes and sizes, which means, ironically, if you're looking for one thing or even a small number of different stereotypes, that will likely blind you to some other signs that might be obvious in hindsight. So today I'll go through seven signs, or perhaps more accurately, seven areas of where to look for common signs of autism. We'll go through social interaction, a need for structure, sensory sensitivities, spiky skill sets, meltdowns, shutdowns, and withdrawals, unusual associations, and finally, in some ways, the simplest yet most powerful one that I'll save until the end. So let's jump straight into it. The first area, the first sign of undiagnosed autism can be found in social interactions. Now, in general, the important thing with all of these is a difference from mainstream population, but there are several differences in this area that tend to be expressed in a very similar way. If I find it difficult to intuitively understand my peers, difficult to conform, difficult to know what to do socially, that often ends up in the whole social interaction process being very draining. I'm thinking about it too much, I'm trying too hard, I'm trying to manually process all of these thousands of tiny little social cues. I'm often not doing a fantastic job, and it's not always a fun process. So that may lead me to avoid social interactions. It may lead me to like to spend a lot of time by myself. It may lead me to appear to be awkward in social situations. Or it may lead me to just ditch the whole trying to be like everyone else altogether and come across as quite eccentric. All of these are signs pointing to a similar thing, namely that it's difficult to fit in and doing what everyone else is doing in the same way that everyone else is doing it is a challenge. Number two is a need for structure and routine. And ironically, whether you see someone who is very structured, very routine oriented, seemingly quite inflexible, or the opposite coming across as chaotic and disorganized, they are often two sides of the same coin. One of the reasons I need stability and routine and security is because I am so flexible. If I don't have a script prepared socially, I could say literally anything. And it turns out a lot of those options are suboptimal. So to help me cut down on that executive function, I make a decision in advance. This is what I'm going to say. This is how I am commonly going to answer the same question if I can predict it in advance. A need for structure will often come across as a person who likes to do things their own way and who really resists conforming to the status quo, especially if there doesn't seem to be a good reason as to why I have to do things the way other people are doing them. And all of these outward signs are effectively pointing towards internal executive function challenges. What you're seeing are my coping mechanisms that allow me to work and get stuff done. And if you take them away, if you interrupt me or disrupt my routine or throw in too many unknowns, then I won't be able to concentrate. I won't be able to prioritize. I won't be able to organize my almost infinitely chaotic brain. And suddenly I'll flip from being super organized to super disorganized. So that's why both those extremes are essentially two sides of the same coin. The third sign of undiagnosed autism in adults is sensory sensitivity. And equally importantly, sensory insensitivity. Now, when people say this, most of the time people are thinking of light and sound and funny tastes and textures and smells and things like that. But sensory is actually a lot more than that. It includes things like pain tolerance, temperature regulation, coordination. That one confused me for a while back when I was first researching autism. How is being clumsy an autistic trait that a lot of children have? And the answer is, it's a sensory sensitivity. If I can't feel where my limbs are in space, I'm more likely to accidentally bump into things and knock things over. If I really like deep pressure, I'm likely to hug people too hard because I don't realize that they don't like it. So the question with all of these is, how far do you fall outside the norm? 
Some people are a little bit sensitive to smell. Some people have a relatively high pain tolerance. But if you start to notice that actually your experience is significantly different to the other people around you, then that's a pretty strong sign of undiagnosed autism. Actually, very quick disclaimer, some of these signs, especially the last two around structure and sensory sensitivity, have a high overlap with ADHD. So if you resonate very strongly with those two and not so much with the others, then uh, maybe something like ADHD might be a better fit. But that's a much more complicated question, so I won't go into that too much today. Okay, so number four, the fourth sign of undiagnosed autism in adults is having a spiky skill set. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about my personal skill set, there are some things that I can do, some things that I can't do, some things that I've learned, some things that I haven't learned. But in terms of intrinsic ability, my ability to learn certain things and perform certain tasks, there are going to be some things that I find generally easier for me and some things that I find just particularly difficult that others, others are fine with, but that I find them really difficult. Some people are good with numbers, for example, and other people haven't thought about math since high school. Well, an extremely common characteristic of autism in children and in adults is having a very spiky skill set, meaning there are some things I am extremely good at, and by extremely, I mean compared to the rest of the population, and some things that I really, really struggle with. Again, compared to the rest of the population. Now, this does not mean savant level skills, I'll give you an example. When I was younger, I used to play a lot of competition tennis, and it was pretty common for there to be a table tennis table inside in the clubhouse so that you could play while you were waiting to go out on the court. I was reasonably good at tennis. I could win things in my local area. There was no chance I would ever play at a state level or a national level or an international level. Reasonably good, but nothing spectacular. And so you would think that skill of being able to play tennis would somehow translate in being able to learn table tennis, right? I mean, roughly the same hit the ball with the bat kind of skills. But for some reason, I was way better than anyone else when it came to table tennis in those kind of tennis clubhouse situations. So much so that I ended up playing with my left hand instead of my right hand just to make it a little bit more fun and interesting for me. Now, if I actually played against someone who knows how to play table tennis, then they would put me in my place very quickly but it's an example of something where I am significantly better than average naturally in one area. Now the opposite is also true. What about something like remembering dates or birthdays or cooking dinner or reading a map? A typical autistic profile will likely have some pretty significant gaps in that skill set. Things that just about every other adult can do fairly easily that for some reason is difficult, almost impossible for us. A personal example that came up for me recently, a lot of restaurants don't have paper menus anymore. They require you to scan a QR code and then figure out what you want online and then order it online through their app. And that's a barrier for me. I would sooner stay home and not eat than have to do that. Whereas for other people, they're like, this is fantastic. I just get food whenever I want it. I don't even have to talk to anyone. Okay, moving on. Number five, the fifth sign of undiagnosed autism in adults is emotional regulation. Things such as meltdowns, shutdowns, and withdrawal. And the reason I'm putting all of them in the same category is because they're kind of all mechanisms to deal with the same thing. What do I do when the world is too much and I just can't take it anymore? Does it hit me unexpectedly and I break down and have a meltdown? Does my brain switch off and I go into survival mode, no information in, no information out, and I just shut down for a little while? Or have I learned to withdraw away from the world, away from relationships, and block out the world that way until I've got enough energy to come back again? Autistic shutdown and withdrawal is a huge challenge in many relationships, and it's one of the top areas that my clients want help with in my relationship coaching work. So if you notice behavior that looks a little bit binary in terms of I'm engaging and everything seems fine and I'm fine and you're fine and we're doing really well and then something happens and suddenly I have melted down or shut down or I've withdrawn and you can't get through to me for some reason. They are relatively extreme forms of emotional regulation that are quite common in the autistic population. A slightly less extreme form of this is a similar behavior but over a shorter time scale. So it might look like, don't talk to me at all for the next two hours, I need to decompress. Or it might look like a habit that I used to have as a teenager of 
having a power nap in the middle of parties. There's music and dancing and people running around making lots of noise and I would just sit on the floor, close my eyes, block out the world for 20 minutes and reset my brain. Fantastic. Okay, number six, the sixth sign of undiagnosed autism in adults is very unusual associations and mental jumps. So I say banana and you say space station, right? Clearly it's obvious what went on in your brain just now. To the outside observer, these seem pretty random. It might be an esoteric quote or picking up on a little side meaning or taking something literally and then running with that instead of picking up on the main meaning of the sentence. But if your brain makes uncommon associations, and again, uncommon is measured based on comparing that to other people. So it's been measured apparently cross-culturally that if you ask people to pick a random color, blue is by far the most common. There are other examples like think of a vegetable. Most people might think carrot or potato. I remember I asked this of a friend of mine in high school and she said rhubarb. And I thought there's something special here. <laughs> How many people when asked to pick a random vegetable would pick rhubarb? That is the definition of unusual compared to your peers. And the result of these natural unusual associations, well, there are lots of positive ones in terms of creativity and things like that, but it does make communication much more difficult because if a link is very clear in my mind, but it just does not occur at all in my listener's mind, that's a problem and vice versa. If I'm listening to someone and they think an implication is obvious and my brain just hasn't gone there, it's gone somewhere completely different, then that can often make communication a bit more challenging. Okay, finally, the last one, the seventh sign of undiagnosed autism. This one is probably the simplest and the most powerful and the hardest to really pinpoint exactly what we mean. The person is just a bit different. What does that mean? Exactly, what does that mean? They're just a bit different. You can't quite put your finger on it. It might be a good different, it might be a bad different, it might just be a neutral kind of quirky different. There is something that makes this person stand out as the odd one out for some reason. And our brains are very, very good at picking the odd one out. I did a video a little while back asking the question, can you spot autism in under a second? You can watch the full video here if you want. But ultimately the answer is yes, you can spot difference. Our brains can pick out patterns and find the odd one out in a split second. Does being the odd one out mean you're autistic? No, not necessarily. However, if you find yourself commonly being the odd one out in a lot of different circumstances, then that is a sign that you might be autistic. If that is you and you resonate strongly with that, it's actually an extremely surreal experience to hang around with the autistic community, especially for the first time, and be surrounded by so many other people who are also a little bit different in lots of different ways that are different to the ways that you're different. How many times can I differently use different in the same different sentence differently? Maybe I should have an eighth category, amuses themselves in ways that are unlikely to be amusing to other people. So this is one of the reasons that I say to understand autism, you should go out and meet autistic people. And if you are questioning yourself, whether you yourself might be an undiagnosed autistic person, then seeing what I've talked about in this video in real life and experiencing what that actually looks like in other people can be a really powerful experience. Because when everyone is the odd one out, ironically, no one is the odd one out. I experienced this properly for the first time running a camp for autistic teenagers several years ago. There was a lot of weird stuff going on. And if you thought, you know what? I'm gonna stand out for the crowd. I'm gonna wear like a pink onesie and see what people think. Well, you wouldn't stand out from the crowd. You might be the only one in a pink onesie, but there are so many other people doing other weird different things in other directions that ironically, your particular clothing choice kind of blends into the background against that. So anyway, I should probably leave it there for today. I have some other videos on this topic as well, if you're interested. I'd probably recommend checking out the playlist on masking and unmasking. And if you're looking to join an autistic community, you might like to consider joining us on Patreon. You can join the community and support this channel financially as well for as little as a dollar a week. 
So thanks so much for everyone who's already supporting through that. We also have an online social group connected through the Facebook page and we do some in-person meetups here in Melbourne as well. So thanks again for watching. I hope you found the content valuable and I'll see you again next time. Bye.